when people matter to you, then they will begin to realize they matter to Jesus. And when people realize they matter to Jesus, then Jesus begins to matter to them. That's how this, that's how this works. So last Saturday night, after Albert Tate finished preaching, I was taking him out to eat. And I noticed on the calendar several days prior that this was going to be during the final four. Right? Like I was going to take him after church to eat, but there are two games on, big games. And Virginia and Auburn were up first, and I thought, it's all right, it's all right. We'll go eat at Buffalo Wild Wings, and we'll watch the game while we eat. It'll be great. And so we're getting into my truck, and I say to him, I say, who are you pulling for tonight? And he kind of looks at me like he doesn't know what I'm talking about. And I start getting a little nervous inside, you know. And I thought, maybe it's a time change from West Coast. Uh, final four. Tonight's the final four. And he let me know that he's not really into that. Huh. So I, at first, thought this is a setup. Like Dave has conspired with Albert, and this whole thing is a setup. But then he said to me, is Mississippi State still in it? Hmm. Mississippi State is never in it. <laughs> it had been a long time since Mississippi State was in it, and I, I knew I was in trouble. I had what you might call a people matter dilemma, because Albert Tate matters to me, absolutely. But the Final Four <laughs> matters to me. And Albert Tate, he's going to be back in a couple of months. The Final Four it's going to be another year, right? And so I, I have this uh, situation. It's not that he doesn't matter to me. It's just that what I want matters to me as well. <laughs> well how do you handle that? This is the people matter dilemma that we all face. It's not that your neighbor doesn't matter to you. Yeah, your neighbor matters to you. But sometimes your privacy matters more. It, it's not that your spouse doesn't matter to you. It's just that sometimes watching a show on Netflix matters more. Or catching up on Instagram matters. It's not that your kids don't matter to you, but, but sometimes your job matters more. It's not that the, the homeless person on the corner or the server at the restaurant or the neighbor down the street. It's not that they don't matter to you. It's just that sometimes what we want has a way of mattering more than someone. And that was never the Jesus way. Jesus was always finding ways to let people know that they matter more to him than himself. They matter more to him than what he might want. Now, here's how I solved my problem with Albert. I've, I've been married 24 years, and so I'm, I'm pro-level at taking someone out to eat and secretly watching a game at the same time. Like, <laughs> I can do that. And so I took him out to eat, and, and, and he sat in the booth, and I had the, I had the game. It was on a monitor just over his um, left shoulder, right? So I'm talking to him. We had a great conversation, I think. And, and I, I'm talking to him about, like, preaching and homiletical theory, and I'll ask him a question. He's brilliant, by the way. I'll ask him a question, and I'll, while he's talking, I'm listening, but I'm also kind of giving a, this thoughtful up and to the right look. Like, hmm. <laughs> And, you know, sometimes you... you Try to balance it. It's not that people don't matter, it's just that sometimes what we want matters and, and we, we miss opportunities to let someone know how much they matter because something we want gets in the way. So this week we're wrapping up this People Matter series and the title of this week's message is No Matter What. Anytime I think the phrase no matter what gets used in any kind of relationship or perhaps partnership, it makes us a little uneasy because we like to have an out. We like to have a way of escape. Like, it's not that people don't matter, but saying no matter what. I mean, people matter unless there's a game on. People matter un unless they need something from me that I don't really want to give. People matter until they say something that hurts me, until they do something that offends me. People matter as long as I matter to them. People matter as long as I feel the way I feel right now. People matter as long as they believe what I believe, as long as they agree with what I agree with. And so it's not that people don't matter, but no matter what, that's just pretty um, unconditional. And we like some conditions. 
If you don't think that's true, sometimes go to like a Hallmark store or a store where there's a greeting card section and just look under relationships and you'll find that most every single one of those cards in one way or another says, you matter to me because of this. You matter to me because you do this for me. You matter to me because you make me feel this way. It's not just you matter to me no matter what. It's, it's you matter to me because of how you make me feel or what you do. That no matter what, love, that's dangerous. It's risky. And some of you have never even experienced it before. But if you do experience it, it changes everything. And so as we prepare our hearts for Easter, this is Holy Week, we want, to, we want to look at someone who experienced the no matter what love of Jesus on the day he died. So the day we're introduced to this man, I think to him it felt like any other day. We're not, we're not told his name, but what we do know about him is he was a centurion, a Roman centurion, which tells you at least that his job mattered to him. Like you don't get to be a centurion unless your job matters, his job mattered. The other thing we know about him is the Jews don't matter to him. In fact, he would have considered Jews to be uh, dogs and would have told them so. Here's a man who is in charge of executing Jews. And so, you know, it's just another day, just another Jew. Jesus doesn't matter to him. His wife says, what are you doing today at work? Oh, there's another Jewish agitator, needs to be dealt with. By dealt with, he means tortured and killed. Jesus didn't matter to him. And, and so you, you read about the Roman centurion and, and you think about the position he was in, how close he was to Jesus, where Pilate, the governor, says to the centurion to have Jesus flogged. And so he has his soldiers strip Jesus like sometimes when you see it portrayed in a painting or such, Jesus has some kind of covering. That's done out of respect by the artist, but it's not accurate. Jesus didn't have covering. He was stripped naked. And then they flog him, they whip him, but the whips are not like just leather pieces where they're putting welts, instead broken glass, sharp rocks, and it was more of a raking that took place. And this centurion that we meet here, he, he would have been considered an expert at beating a man within the edge of his life. Although I use the word expert lightly because one historian says as many as six out of 10 men didn't survive the scourging. And they tied the hands of Jesus together and they stretch out his, backs, his back a third century historian by the name of Eusebius describes the flogging by saying the sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles and bowels of the victim were open to exposure. I know some, I know some of you feel like that's unnecessary. You don't understand why we would include that. It seems like it's just a little bit too much information but if you, really, if you really want to understand how much people matter to Jesus, then you have to understand what he endured for people. The depth of what he endured shows you the depth of how much people matter to him. See, if, if this was just another person getting crucified, then I, I would agree with you. We probably don't need to include some of these details. I mean, it's not like they're choosing it. They don't even have an option. But this is where it's different because Jesus chose it. John chapter 10, Jesus says, um, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down. And so what he's enduring is not being forced upon him. He is giving his life willingly. And so we read in Matthew 26 that he has 12 legion of angels at his call. You know how many 12 Legion would be 72,000. 72,000 angels 
are watching, and with every crack of the whip and every cry of agony and every drop of blood that hits the ground, they're just, just waiting. Say the word, and this will be over. He didn't, he didn't even need them. I mean, Jesus could have blinked and struck this centurion and all of the soldiers with advanced leprosy. But he didn't do that. I mean, what could have mattered to him so much that he would endure it? If you read the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew tells you a little bit about the ridicule and the humiliation that he experienced as part of this, how the soldiers would spit on him, mock him while the centurion looks on. And one of the soldiers takes, a, um, takes some thorns and weaves the thorns together into a crown and he's always doing stuff like this. Everybody start, starts laughing and he presses it onto the skull of Jesus. And not a lot of nerve endings in the top of your head but a lot of capillaries and so but just a bloody mess as blood fills his eyes and fills his ears. Nobody's making him do that. So what could have possibly mattered so much to him? And, and so we, we see the centurion early on in the story, and Jesus doesn't matter to him. But then he, as part of his job, he stands closer to the cross than anyone. So he's right in front of the cross. So he has this front row seat. And something happens while he is in this position that changes him and by the time you get to the end of the crucifixion, by the time Jesus dies, you find out that Jesus matters to this centurion. So here's what Mark says, Gospel of Mark. says, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus, he's standing right in front of the cross, when he saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. What happened? He didn't matter, Jesus didn't matter to him, and now he does. Matters a lot. Reaches a conclusion, this man was the son of God. So what, what happened? What did that centurion witness that would have caused that kind of transformation? Well, if you read it in context, you might say, well, the ground shook and the sky grew dark and that's what did it. Uh, maybe. Might have helped put an exclamation point on the whole thing, but a lot of people saw that. And they didn't come to the same conclusion. Just got me thinking what happened that made Jesus matter to this centurion. I mean, maybe it was just the way he died. I mean, that's what Mark says when he saw how he died. So maybe that was it. Like, no one had ever died this way before. Like, every other, every other person that he had crucified, it takes two, three of his soldiers, maybe four, to, to stretch out an arm unwillingly to be nailed to a tree. And Jesus, he stretches out his own arm. Nobody's gonna do that. Maybe that was it. Or, or maybe it was something Jesus said. Like, on the cross, Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I suppose that could have been it, but I don't, I don't think this Roman centurion even knew what that meant. I, I mean, he doesn't realize Jesus is quoting a psalm that prophesies a crucifixion before crucifixion had been invented. He doesn't know that. He, he doesn't realize that, that Jesus was forsaken so that we could be forgiven, that all of our sin was placed upon Jesus in that moment. I don't, I don't think that was it. I, I wonder, though, if it was when Jesus looked down from the cross and, and he sees his mother Mary and in the midst of such agony and pain, he talks to his mom and makes sure that she's taken care of. She's with John, the disciple that Jesus loved. And Jesus says, John, you take care of my mom. Do you think that happened very often? I bet it didn't. I wonder if that softened that centurion's heart. Who, who is this man? I don't, I don't know, though. I, I, I don't think that was it either. I, I think instead, the moment Jesus started to matter to this man was the moment he realized that he mattered to Jesus. There's something, something about that. Every other man that this centurion had crucified had either pleaded with him or cursed him. Think about this. 
He stands at the foot of the cross day after day. He's done this hundreds of times. And every person that's crucified is, is cursing him or pleading with him, making empty promises or, or empty threats. That's it. And, and now he stands at the foot of the cross and he hears Jesus say something that he just can't, he just can't wrap his mind around. Like he has been whipped and beaten, he has been ridiculed and mocked, he's been nailed to a tree, and Jesus says, Father, forgive them. I think that was the moment. What kind of love is that? Like at, at his worst moment, while he is crucifying the Son of God, Jesus says, Father, forgive them. And I think Jesus started to matter to him the moment he realized how much he mattered to, to Jesus. I think that's what happened. And there's just this incredible power. And some of you really need to hear this. Jesus loves you no matter what. No matter what, no matter what you've done, no matter what sins you've committed, he, he loves you no matter how long you've been running from him. He, he, he loves you no matter how broken you are. He loves you no matter what kind of words that you've spoken. He loves you no matter what. There's, there's nothing you can do to make you matter more to him. And there's nothing you can do to make you matter less to him. That's how much you matter to him. And in your moment of greatest guilt and shame is the moment Jesus dies for you. Father, forgive them. So as a church, we want to be this kind of church. We want to be a no matter what kind of church. A church that loves people the way that Jesus loved people because when, when we love people that way, then they start to realize how Jesus loves them and then they're a lot more open to loving Jesus. We, we wanna be that kind of church, and I think oftentimes the church can be a place where people matter with an asterisk. It's, it's certain people matter. And if, if you look a certain way, and if you talk a certain way, and if you have a certain background, and if you haven't done certain things, or at least nobody knows about them, then you're, you're okay. Certain people matter. That's not Jesus. In fact, Jesus went out of his way to make sure the people who would have thought they mattered least to God to make sure he, they knew how much they mattered to him. You just read that again and again throughout the Gospels. And I think this is the moment for the centurion. Over the last um, month or so, you know, Dave and I have been transitioning um, leadership, and, and really we've been doing this for the last three plus years, but there are some things that he's kind of been holding on to, and then, and then this month, um, transitioned them off to me. One of those things that he's been doing is, is making phone calls to people in the church who've lost a loved one. So I knew he did this, and, and, and honestly, I, it's one of the things I was looking forward to. It is, a, it is a, I have come to appreciate this as a sacred privilege to be able to pray and speak into someone's life during a moment like that. And What I didn't realize is how many of them there are. And so this week, it's kind of my first turn with that. And there's probably, there's probably 20, 20 of what we would call death notifications where someone in the church has passed away or an immediate loved one has passed away. Now, now sometimes we don't get notified. And, and sometimes a campus pastor will take that directly if, if they have a relationship with that person. But, but there's like about 20 people on this list and, and I, you know, I pray for the person and I call the person, talk to them, pray with them. Kind of work my way down the list and a, a couple hours into it, it strikes me every week for years that Dave has, has done this. I start doing the math. I add up to conservatively over 5,000 such phone calls. Why? Because people matter. Pe people matter. And when people matter to us, they start to realize that they matter to Jesus, and then Jesus starts to, to matter to them. 
And, and so you see what Jesus did on the cross and you start to realize how much people matter. Isaiah 55 or 53 verse five says, he was pierced for our rebellion, he was crushed for our sins, he was beaten so we could be whole, he was whipped so we could be healed. What mattered to him so much that he would endure such things? You did, you did. Your neighbor did, your classmate did, your coworker did, that's who did. A number of years ago, I, I, um, I went to trade a car in at a dealership, which is, um, what's the word? Miserable, right? So I knew that I was gonna be disappointed but I, whatever they said the car was worth. So I did a little bit of homework on it, kind of had a number in my mind that I thought was fair. And then I, I sit down with the guy, and I didn't want to like him, but I did. I just liked the guy. And, and he, he was very transparent. He said, hey, I'll just tell you up front, you're not gonna, you're not gonna think the number I give you is, is high enough. And I said, I, I understand. Um, you know, I, I understand that I may not agree with you. And, and, you know, just so you know, <laughs> the number I have in mind, you might not agree with, right? Like, and he said, I'll, I'll come right back. And, and he came back with a piece of paper. It's always a bad sign. Like, if they don't have the courage to speak it, <laughs> like, if they can't say it out loud, it's not going to be good. So he slides the paper across the desk, and I open it up. And it's not like we didn't, I didn't stand up. We did not embrace and celebrate the news together. Like, that's not at all what happened. And, um, and so I kind of pushed back on him. So, well, here's what I think it's worth. And. Kelly Blue Book, and he said, look, we're 100% transparent. I'll show you exactly how we got to this. No. He gets online, shows me some kind of live auction where you can see exactly how much that particular vehicle model with miles and years, how, how much it's going for. And he says to me, look, I, you know, this is, just, this is what they will sell for, and something is only worth as much as someone's willing to pay for it. Yeah, and that's a hard thing to argue with. Something's only worth as much as someone is willing to pay for it. And so the, the value of it gets established by how much someone says, I'll pay. I'll pay that much for this. That's how much it's worth. And so the cross is God's statement of worth and value on people. See, sometimes we think, well, how much... Does God really care? How much do I really matter to him? And we look at life circumstances and we think about our situation and if he really cared, then this wouldn't have happened. And, and, and the cross is the yardstick that we use to measure how much people matter to God. Here's how much I am, I am willing to pay for your salvation with my only son. Here's how much you matter. And so this centurion, I think, gets a glimpse of that kind of love and he recognizes that there's something about Jesus. According to church tradition, uh, after the resurrection of Jesus, the centurion left the military and he was baptized by the disciples. And from there he went to his home country where he was an evangelist, where he, he told people about Jesus. So you know, sometimes the question is, well, how do we know what Jesus said from the cross? And of course, there's numerous possible answers. Maybe John heard him. You know, maybe Jesus told him after he, after the resurrection, after he rose from the dead. Or maybe, maybe the centurion, maybe he told people. And so church tradition says that he went to his home country and this man who, who was responsible for the physical death of Jesus begins telling people about Jesus, the good news about Jesus, and eventually he's martyred for his faith. And, and I don't know when he would have gotten baptized. Acts chapter two tells us that this is after G Jesus ascended into heaven, that there is uh, this day where thousands of people are baptized. I, I can't help but wonder if the centurion would have been in the crowd that day because the sermon Peter preached on that day, the title of it could be um, you killed the Son of God. Like that, if, not a super seeker sensitive sermon title, but I think that's probably what it would be called is, hey everybody, you killed the Son of God. And, and if the centurion would have been listening to that sermon that day, he must have felt just overwhelmed with conviction 
because the rest of the people were too. They listen to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2, and, and, and they say, it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 37, when the people heard it, they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. And whenever you're convicted, you know you need to do something. And so they ask Peter, brothers, what should we do? And I got to think, this is the centurion's struggle. Like, he realizes Jesus is the Son of God, and from that point forward, he must have been asking this question. What do I do about what I did? What do I do about what I've done? It's a tough question, and it's one that some of you struggle with like right now. You cannot believe what you did. What do you do about what you did? And so Peter, verse 38, says, here's what you do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's pretty clear. So here's how you respond. You repent and, and you be baptized. Now, <clears throat> I'm always surprised that like the mental gymnastics people will do to try to make this say something other than what it does. Like, I guess I would understand if this was Old Testament-y. Like, if, if this was Old Testament, if this, if this was something along the lines of yeah, circumcision, then yeah, let's do some mental gymnastics. Let's see if we can figure out a way out of this. But it says, repent and be baptized. Is that, is that too much? I mean, we've just looked at everything Jesus has done for you and for me. Is, is this too much? And it's as if Peter knew that someday people in some culture far away would feel like, well, we're a little too sophisticated to be dunked under the water. And it just doesn't seem that important now. And so Peter adds this to it. It's right in the Bible, Acts 2, verse 39. This promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And so with the cross, we see the no matter what love of Jesus demonstrated and through repentance and baptism, we demonstrate our no matter what commitment to Jesus. Um, next week for Easter weekend, we're, we're gonna have a, a special baptism time. In 2015, on Easter, we had a kind of a, a, a special baptism celebration. We're gonna do that again this year. It's such an appropriate way to celebrate Easter as baptism captures the death and burial and then the resurrection, raising up out of the water to live a new life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And, and so I, I wanna challenge some of you, if you've not been baptized, if you've not made that decision for yourself, like you can't, like your parents can't make this decision for you. It's a personal decision. If you've not done that, next week would be a great week to take that step. It's a great way to respond to the no matter what love of Jesus. I, I know that some of you might have questions about baptism. We put a sermon up on our website um, under sermons where Dave and I just go through some pretty common questions. So I encourage you to check that out if it's something you're thinking through. Uh, you know, sometimes teachers will say, well, there's no bad questions. And yeah, if you're a teacher, you know that's not true. There are bad questions. And, <laughs> And with baptism, you know, for the most part, there's no bad questions. But there is a question that I don't, I just, I just ask you not to ask me. Uh, do I have to be baptized? Do I have to? Don't ask, please don't ask. Like, I don't want to get annoyed. I really don't. And if, if you ask me, do I have, do I have to? I, I will get annoyed. Like, really? Really? Do you have to? Like, do you, do you realize what we've been studying, what Jesus has done for you? Is this really so much to ask, to repent, to be baptized? In 2011, I finished preaching, on a Saturday night, I finished preaching a sermon on baptism. And then after church was over, um, I, was, I was told that there was a Presbyterian minister that was traveling through and visited us at church on Saturday night, and he wanted to talk to me about my sermon. Well, this will be fun. And so I, I went around and, and met up with him, and he, he told me that he had retired as a Presbyterian minister. He'd spent over 30 years in ministry. I, I, I thanked him for his faithfulness and how he'd served God, and he, he talked to me for a few, more, a few more minutes, and then he just stopped. He said, hey, look, Will you baptize me tonight? I told him I would be honored, and I was. 
Oh, man, God, God sees that humility. And it was a special, it was a special evening, special moment. And, and after it, we were done, you know, I, I gave him a hug and, and, you know, thanked him for listening and responding to, to what Scripture teaches in this. And, and uh, I started to walk away, and then I just knew there was one other thing I needed to say to him, and I didn't want to say it to him. Like, I, I was, he'd already taken such a big step here, and I knew that wasn't easy, but I knew that there was one more conversation we needed to have, and, and, and so I, I turned back towards him, and I'm like, hey, I, I, I think there's still one more thing we need to talk about. And he said, I know what you're gonna say. He said, when I get home, I'm gonna write a letter to the people in the church where I was a minister, and I'm gonna tell them, I was baptized. That's what I was going to say. I, like, he, he, he understood. He, he understood that it's not just about him. And it's not just about the fact that he matters to Jesus and Jesus matters to him, but there, there are others that matter to Jesus. And, and they need to hear how he responded. And, and so I want to encourage you this week as we prepare for Easter, that if you've got a friend, a family member, neighbor, coworker, invite them to come to Easter with you this next weekend just to hear how much they matter to God. We're just gonna love on them. I've never had any experience of someone inviting someone else to Easter and then that person getting angry with them. Maybe that's happened. If it has, keep it to yourself because I like being able to say I haven't heard that. <laughs> But I'm telling you, people, even if they don't come, people appreciate, like they realize, oh, I matter to them because that's why they've invited me. And so you have an opportunity, I know, to do that this week. I'd love to challenge you to do it. And we're gonna have some time here as we wrap up this service. We have communion stations um, set up around the sanctuary. There's also some invite cards next to these communion stations where you can take communion and then you can grab an invitation card to hand out to somebody in your life. Let me pray for us and then we'll have some time. God, I thank you for your grace um, that you demonstrated to us on the cross that while we were still sinners, that literally while we were furthest away from you is when you expressed your love to us. It's when you died for us. And I pray, God, that you would just give us a glimpse of your no matter what love for us. I know that if we can just get a glimpse of that, it changes everything. And God, I would just pray that as a church, you would help us be a church that, that lives this out, that, that just as people matter to you, people would matter to us, and as people realize that they matter to us, they'll know they matter to you, and you'll start to matter to them. So help us, God, to have opportunities this week to, to demonstrate how much someone matters to us. It's in Jesus' name, amen.